yeah, so this is kind of like a hodgepodge lecture, so I'll mention, uh, at the end. I didn't get the lecture until like yesterday, so, uh, but, but uh, we're going to go over kind of like the main point, like how to assess who's a candidate, and, and then at the end I'll talk about complications, and, um, and then I'll explain the difference between wafer guide and wafer optimized, because I didn't really understand it until like, uh, it's like one of those things you like read, you know, when you're studying like, cats or maybe not, and uh, you gotta read like 20 times, and then you still don't understand. Uh, that's, I'm not very smart, so. All right, so uh, I think the big thing, you know, number one, like you need to pick the right patient. So some people have unrealistic expectations, which, you know, this is a cosmetic surgery essentially, and, and I mean, it's, it's functional, but if you've ever experienced, like in your plastics clinic, people who had, who are kind of that, cash pay cosmetic group, like there's a higher expectation than if it's functional in general. And so you have to kind of really explain things to people because you don't want an unhappy patient. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think obviously informed consent is super important and you really want to, you know, avoid promises. Like that's like something really practical for all you since you're probably not going to do much refractive surgery in residency is kind of learning how to temper expectations for cataract surgery because you're all going to do a lot of cataract surgery and it's like people in the community people think because their their friend and their neighbor can see 2020 without their glasses that that's going to be their outcome and it's just like not practical for everyone one thing dr mifflin says that like i really like is especially for cataract surgery like we treat it like it's a refractory procedure but it's really not because our lens choices only come in half diameter steps and so inherently there's going to be some kind of, most times there's going to be some kind of refractive error afterwards, and sometimes that can be visually significant. And so you have to really talk to people about that because, um, you know, those unrealistic expectations. Like I had a guy, it's like one of my last, I think it was like last time of my residency, and he was at the VA. He had, had a ruptured globe like 25 years before, and he had a central corneal laceration, and he had an iris defect and a big nasty cataract. Um, and I was like, he had like 10 doctors of irregular corneal astigmatism. I was like, and he came and he's like, yeah, the doctor, this outside doctor said I could go to the VA and get this lens that corrects for astigmatism for free. And I was like, let's, let's set your expectations right. Like, we're going to take out your cataract and probably help you see better, but your vision is not going to be perfect because, like, we can't correct this linear, really weird astigmatism right in the center of your cornea. And so, you know, I talked to him, I, probably, I think I talked to him for like half an hour every time he came in. Surgery went fine, and then afterwards he, would, he was still like, I don't get it, I can't see very well. These two other doctors said I could have this toric lens. I was like, dude, you need to realize, like, this is all we've been talking about. You need to, you're going to wear heart contact or glasses or some prior heart contact to see well. And anyway, so you can still explain stuff to people that they're not going to get it, but at least you've done your job. And then, I, super important is that, uh, documentation so we're gonna I have like a patient case and we'll just talk about like what I would document for that so um, like I said like you know do patients have what's like the motivation for getting refractive surgery a lot of times people come in because their contact lens intolerant and they hate wearing their glasses and they're pretty nearsighted and they just want to be glasses free and a lot of times that's fine and people do really well but you know what if they're like 45 and they're minus 250 both eyes are minus 150 and you know they they want to have really good distance and near vision because they they probably wear contacts or something and they're kind of getting that presbyopic age um, you have to really talk about that because they're going to have to make some choices and we do see patients where we do refractive surgery on them and they're in their mid 40s and a lot of times we try to convince them to try mono vision out so that they can have the best of both worlds or they just have to realize you're going to have to sacrifice you know one or the other so um, What's their social history? You know, um, what do they do th for their profession? So we have, you know, we're the providers for the Olympic ski team now. I don't know if you guys knew that, but we had uh, someone who was going to go to the Olympics probably come in, and you know, he wanted to have. I should say this person. Uh, <laughs> stop the record button. Um, you know. They want to have refractive surgery because, like, maybe get a competitive advantage, can't wear contacts because they're going super fast and dries out and hates classes. And so, because 
there was potential to like you know crash going like 70 miles an hour we're like hey maybe you should get PRK or really sick but like training he, this person was like training in Chile like right now like started in July and it's going to be there for the next six months and so you know we are like okay LASIK's like probably fine so he got LASIK because he could come for a day and a half and then he had to go back but you know are you a boxer <clears throat> like is that going to happen <clears throat> maybe not the best to get LASIK because those flaps never truly heal all the way and we'll talk about that later but we had a rock climber come in he wasn't like professional but kind of like a really serious amateur and he does big traditional climbing and he says he gets like grit and dirt in his eyes all the time and so he chose PRK because he's like I don't want to I don't want to be on the a face and you know have a problem and can't see um, contact lens use I think this is probably like you know if you do off the questions uh, you probably notice like there's this there's just a ridiculous amount of refractive surgery questions and you're probably not going to be tested on most of them but I think this is something maybe OCAP worthy um, how long do people need valid contacts before they have an eval or refractive surgery? So typically, like, our policy here is they need to be on soft contacts for a week. And this is straight from BCSC, so it says three days to two weeks, depending on whatever the surgeon preference is. And then hard contacts, like, we, we really follow this. We say, like, two-week minimum. And then technically, it's, like, one month for every decade of life, but that's crazy. Like, people don't want to do that. People who are at hard contacts like really value their super awesome vision and if you tell them they've been wearing, we've had patients who've been wearing them for 55 years and coming for cataract surgery and, like we tell them that and they're like there's no way I can do that. So what, what we do is like say when you stay at your contacts for two weeks and then we have come back like every couple weeks and just see when it's the cornea is like really stabilizes because over time it'll stabilize and yeah you might there might be a difference that one month and five months if they're wearing their RGPs for 55 years, but it's not going to be that big of a difference. And then you just have to check your expectations, saying your cornea will change shape after cataract surgery, or you know, refractive surgery. But most people who are wearing RGPs haven't worn there and want to get refractive surgery haven't been wearing them for 55 years. So, and just kind of as an example, so this was a patient who was actually going to have cataract surgery, and so they wore RGPs for like 30 years. So you can see, you know, you kind of have, and they have keratoconus, so I'm giving that away. But you know, you can see kind of like this inferior steepening, but it's not really like a typical keratoconus type picture. So this is, and then this next one is like when this person was out of their RGPs for a month. So you can see like it really changed shape quite a bit. So it's just kind of, for me, it's point home that you know, these people, you, the people have to be patient. They can't expect the results right away, and they're just going to be waiting for a procedure. And I think we did cataract surgery in this person. They ended up doing really well. So, um, other considerations for refractive surgery, like preoperatively, is dry eye. So, Dr. Mifflin likes to say we live in the second dry state, and there's a lot of pollution around here, a lot of agriculture and factories, and so there's a lot of dry eye. And it's kind of windy. And so people who have dry eye before, especially in LASIK, are probably going to have dry eye after LASIK and maybe a lot worse. And basically it's because you're just cutting all the corneal nerves when you hit the flap. And um, you know you get kind of this rejection. It's just like a nerve, it's basically a neurotrophic eye, but usually not permanent. And so they get all these things here. Um, injury to limbal goblet cells may be from like the suction that's applied for the fentolaser when they make the flap or back in the day when it's a microkeratome. Um, but you can see this eye is like super dry and we've had patients who like come in, they have like mild dry eye and we're like, you know, you should probably get PRK and then they want LASIK and then they have like four plus epithelial erosions and like their vision's blurry. So most of the time though, I think it's on the next, um, and, and this is something that was cut off by my sweet picture, but um, you know, dry eye sufferers don't want to wear contacts either and so like a lot of times people come in with dry eye because they want to be out of contacts and they hate their glasses so um so you just have to talk a lot about dry eye like i had an evaluation I've, i think i'm doing her case on friday and she's got like a little asymmetric dry eye, like maybe trace pk in one eye and i told her like you know you could do lasik but you're probably gonna dry after and because of like work consideration stuff fast recovery she wanted to do lasik over so I'll just remind her um, afterwards. But I think this is like an important point. Like 
uncorrected visual acuity at one year is no different if people are dry or not. And that's something I've noticed just being here for a couple months is that people can have crazy, ridiculous dry eye after they sick, but they still see really well. And that's part of the problem because they have a neurotrophic cornea, they see really well, and they don't realize that their eyes like really dry, so they don't have a lot of motivation to use tears. So, but in general, for LASIK, sick, we have people on like preserved free tears like four times a day for six months at, usually. Um, PRK induces less dry eye because you're not uh, denervating the cornea. And then, you know, there are ways to treat it, like we'll do plugs, tears uh, frequently for people, sometimes like vitamin C, doxycycline, things like that. Um, and then, like, you know, there's some, there have been a lot of research and a lot of papers supporting that PRK is better than LASIK for dry eye. And, and like I mentioned this, there, there's some theories behind why femto is better, maybe the thinner flap causes less um, nerve disruption, and the, the suction's a lot lower with the femto. Um, than the microcaritone, so maybe you have less damage on the cells. Um, people can still have refractive surgery after having HSV, um, but you just gotta be careful. So like if we, Dr. Mifflin's policy is like if they've been quiet for three months, and then he'll do it, and you know, you, you gotta make sure they don't have a big scar or anything, like things like that, but sometimes we'll increase the dose of their antiviral therapy during the Really post operative period, but um, and you know, no one really knows what causes HSV to flare, but maybe these two things after who knows. Um, but yeah, like I said, you know, if they have a recent attack, if they have a neurotrophic cornea scarring, or if the cornea is really thin, you probably should do refractive surgery. So, and then, like I mentioned, prophylaxis, and then keratoconus is like the big absolute cardinal intricate, whatever I can't say the word, you can read up there. Um, to laser vision correction. And like back in the you know early mid 90s when like everyone was getting LASIK and they were doing like minus 14, minus 16 diopter corrections, which actually the FDA has approved LASIK up to minus 14, but like no one does that because it's crazy. Um, you know, a lot of times back before tomography, which is like the Pentacam or the Galilee, were really in vogue, like people were doing refractive surgery without without getting tomography, so they couldn't look at the posterior cornea. And a lot of times that's kind of the tiebreaker to decide whether someone has uh, keratoconus or not. And so these people, because they have a progressively thinning cornea, when you ablate you know, a third of their corneal thickness, their cornea just gets thinner over time and they have really unstable refractions. Um, so so like, like it mentions here, the trick is identifying sub subtle cases and then this is kind of a big question. I didn't include any like, slides on this, but so if you guys have patients, we just started cross-linking on Friday, and it's super boring. Like you, they, the patient, you debride their epithelium, and then they sit there for 30 minutes while you drop uh, this riboflavin drop on their eye every two minutes for 30 minutes, and then you make sure the cornea is thick enough, and then they stare at UV light for 30 minutes, and you keep dropping drops on their eye for every two minutes. So it's boring, but. In Europe and some places in the US that have been doing crossing for a while, people who had like mild keratoconus and their corneas are nice and thick and they've been crosslinked, they will do a PRK or some people will do LASIK if they're a good candidate. And there's some newer technologies, you probably, there's this new thing, newish, called topography guided um, refractive surgery or LASIK. Um, and we actually have it on our machine, it's called Contura. And basically what it does is it, it kind of treats more of the, the, the corneal map versus just treating the refraction, which is what traditional um, PRK and LASIK does. And so we just started doing it. We got the upgrade like two months ago and we really just started doing it. But So I think in the future here, probably not this year, but probably next year we'll start on select people who will, who've been cross-linked, we'll start doing um, refractive surgery. So do you guys understand cross-linking? Any questions about it? Who are y'all doing it on? Who so keratoconus? So people who have a like risk for ectasia. So keratoconus patients and then post lasik ectasia are like, like the two like every indications. Keratoconus patient, hmm? Like which keratoconus patient? Like if it's not super severe. So their cornea has to be thick enough. Like the the FDA trials, their cornea had to be after you take off their epithelium had to be three hundred microns. Um, the new FDA guidelines say it has to be after you put all, because when you put all these drops on, actually they have 
the drops have dextran in them, so it actually dehydrates the cornea as you're putting these drops on. And you're supposed to check the central pachymetry, uh, and the cornea is supposed to be 400 microns thick or greater before you cross-link, because there's some, there's some idea in research that if the cornea is too thin, when you use UV light, you're gonna actually cross-link the endothelium too, and you can damage it. So essentially it's like putting rebar in concrete to straight. So like I grew up in Southern California and all the houses are retrofitted for earthquakes or built to withstand earthquakes. And the way they do that is they put, you know, pile of rebar inside the concrete when they set the concrete down. And it adds stability and strength. And so that's essentially what we're doing to the cornea. It's the same technology like if you go to the dentist and you need a cavity filled and they use a little UV light on the, the resin, that's cross-linking basically. So, so the idea is like you're going to basically strengthen the cornea and then it might be stable enough that it's going to stop getting ectatic and probably prevent the people from getting the cornea transplant. And maybe for some people they could get um, topography guided refractive surgery afterwards. So. so the goal would more be to like prevent them from like, because they've got to, I guess, be at the point where they don't need a cornea transplant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you would. You're trying to prevent them from needing one in the future. So it, like maybe the people who look like they're getting worse over time. Yeah, and really, like, they don't even have to get worse, so, like, oh, okay. even mild, because, like, you don't know who's going to progress. I mean, you, you know, right. like, yeah. if someone's 16 years old and their cornea has Ks of 58 and 65, like, they're probably going <laughs> to need a cornea transplant, but, you know, we just saw a teenager yesterday, and his cornea was 650 microns thick, and he had <coughs> inferior steepening, and he had kind of this keratoconus-type picture, and we're still going to do crossing <coughs> on him because he's 16, and... Keratoconus patients tend to get thinner as they get in their mid-20s. So late teens to early mid-20s is where they really progress. So we're going to offer it to everyone who kind of fits that <coughs> picture for now. So is so. insurance covering it? Um, only a couple insurance providers here. So like Blue Cross Blue Shield, I think Aetna is. But Select Health is not, which a lot of people ask look through insurance through IHC. So we're charging $2,500 per eye, which is like pretty comparable to the other places that are doing it on the Wasatch front. And it takes the whole hour to do it. Yeah, it's like really, it takes really like 75 minutes and yeah. you can't like, the machine itself has a timer for that first 30 minutes. So like we thought at first like, hey, we'll, we'll do it on one person and then 30 minutes after they start, we'll bring a new patient in, but you can't do that because there's like this set timer. Oh. So that, so it's gonna, we have a list of 300 patients, just Dr. Mifflin does, um, <laughs> you need, you want it. And, and so, you know, that's going to be a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you should invent an uh, eye drop yeah. uh, dropper that drops automatically every I know. <laughs> two minutes before that yeah. happens. I did, do you have a question? You just, yeah. So when you do cross-linking on these patients, do they ever have to then be on contact when this happens? Yeah, so I mean, it's not, it's basically like, hopefully prevent them becoming from, their corneas becoming thinner. Most people, their corneas get a little bit flatter, but it's not like this miracle where their Ks drop 10 diopters. You know, it's, it's probably, it's pretty mild. It's usually like four to five diopters at the most. So, you know, it's, it's definitely not like a, a procedure where it's not a miracle procedure, but it's the best thing we have. And so you, I've, I've been telling everyone, you're probably going to still be wearing the same contact you're wearing now, maybe a little bit different power. But, you know, if they're in soft contacts, we'll probably stay in soft contacts. If they're in hard contact, they'll probably still be in a hard one, depending on how steep their cornea is. So, I have a question. Yeah. Can you guys do it on lucid patients? Yeah. I mean, you, you can. It just depends on if their cornea is too thin, then they're not a good candidate. And that's really, like, the biggest thing. And obviously, like, you know, do you need to do cross-linking on a 70-year-old who has keratoconus? Probably not. Like, their cornea is probably as thin as it's ever going to get. So, and we usually see a lot of patients for cataract surgery, like that first patient, who, or some people have keratoconus and it's not visually significant and they come in for cataract surgery and they just have, you know, a lot of astigmatism. A lot of the keratoconus patients, they actually look over the cone and, you know, so their cornea is actually flatter in the center and so this a lot of times doesn't bother them. We had a guy who is trying to become an army pilot, like fly helicopters and on his routine exam, like on the last thing, they found that he had keratoconus but he's 2015 uncorrected in both eyes. So it's like really mild, mild case. And so he was coming to Dr. Mifflin to like kind of get ammunition so that he could go and be a pilot because like that's a contraindication to let someone be a 
pilot. But he was like 31 and like probably not going to get worse. So it's kind of an interesting, tricky situation. And he may not get worse. So um, Anyway, so this is kind of like the, have you guys heard this term, form fruits keratoconus? It's like keratoconus suspect. So someone whose map looks keratoconus or pellucid-like, but they don't have visual problems. Um, and so you, these are people you just watch. And these are candidates for cross-linking also. Um, but you know, even these patients, a lot of the, the post-LASIK ectasia patients probably have form fruits keratoconus. And it's just unrecognized. And then it kind of, when they got LASIK, it pushed them into the keratoconus ectasia world. Um, but you just got to be really careful. This is like the big thing. This is why we do imaging a lot of times on patients for refractive surgery screenings because you don't want to do a patient like this. Like, you're, we don't want to do harm. You're setting yourself up for a huge lawsuit if you do something like this. So. Um, and, you know, this is a keratoconus doesn't have to look the same every time. You know, this person, I, I, I don't know what Dr. Mifflin case was, but I mean, this refraction is not very bad, right? And the central cornea, not that steep, but this person definitely has keratoconus, so you just gotta be careful. Um, yeah, so, and the big thing is in case, because I didn't know very much until I actually started here about this, but you wanna look at the posterior cornea, so the posterior elevation. So if you get the, on the penicam, you can do, do you guys have penicam at the VA? It's a centimeter. Okay. Um, anyways, you look at the elevation on the back side, and if you see, I'll show you a case later that doesn't have keratoconus, but these numbers are all out of whack. Like from the central cornea, all these numbers should be like within 10 to 15. So whether it's plus or minus, but if you have this big plus, like 30 like that, that means that the cornea is bowing out, the posterior cornea is coming anteriorly. And that's, this is absolutely keratoconus, so you wouldn't want to do refractive surgery on this patient. And then just, just to show you what it could look like, this is a patient we actually had to do, she had cross linking, then we had to do a cornea transplant on her and um, just like three weeks ago, but you can see like this had post like she had LASIK 15 years ago. Cornea is like crazy steep, looks like keratoconus, super bowed out. I can't even see what that number is, but it's like uh, plus 82. So, you know, that cornea is gonna have a hard time seeing if, if you put them in an RGP, so. Um, you can do refractive surgery on cornea transplants. You just have to be, pick, select people well. Typically, you want to wait till all the sutures are out. Um, and a lot of times, like, Dr. Mifflin's fairly conservative in taking sutures out. Like, he'll take them out until they have, you know, two diopters of astigmatism or less, and then we'll just keep them in. And because people can see well the glasses with that. You know, if, they're, if they have 10 diopters of astigmatism, then you have a problem. But there are people who can have, uh, a lot of times we'll do PRK. You can do LASIK on top of the transplant. You just have to be careful. There are some considerations, I think, on my next slide. But did he talk about these, like, like coronary relaxing incisions, wedge, wedge resection? Did he talk about that at all? So sometimes, like, we had a patient who had 10 doctors of astigmatism. All of her sutures were out, and she couldn't see very well. So actually, what we did is we, on the steep axis of her cornea, we took her to the OR, and we basically broke open the, the wound, the graftose junction, and tried not to perforate the cornea and kind of relax it and then just put in and put in some sutures at the flat axis to make it tighter and steeper. And I think we got her down to like two doctors after that. A wedge resection is like, that's compression sutures. A wedge resection is like this extreme version where essentially you break the graftose junction and then you cut a wedge of tissue out of the host. It's kind of like, you know, like, a, like an ellipse basically. So you kind of create this huge gap and then you sew it. And you make the, you basically, you, you try to increase the stigmatism on the flat axis. Um, and then relaxed incisions are just like limbal relaxed incisions. You can do them in the graft or outside the graft. Um, in the graft, they have a really powerful effect because it's closer to the visual axis, so you have to be careful. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, you want to make sure, you know, they have refractive stability. A lot of PK patients are wearing RGPs. And then, you know, with LASIK, it's kind of tricky because, like, you're going to put this suction cup on their cornea. And if you've all ever seen a dehisc cornea, like, 12 years out, like, those wounds never heal. And so you just got to be really careful. And then haze with PRK, we'll talk about that as a risk. And then there's other things like glaucoma. We don't know 
just like when you do a vast in injections, you know, the, you have this transient high rise in IOP, and there's always questions about whether that increases the rate of progression of glaucoma. Same with putting on, a, this is a microkeratome, or, you know, doing like a femtoflap or microkeratome, does that increase pressure so much that damages the optic nerve? And you gotta be really careful about filtering bloods. You know, you don't want to put like a crazy amount of pressure on an eye that has a filtering blood because bad things happen. Um, but it's not a, it's not like a super crazy contraindication with glaucoma. You could we would probably do PRK on those patients, and they would probably do fine as long as they don't have vision loss from glaucoma. Can I ask a question about the previous slide? There was a thing about like a regular astigmatism. Can you do PRK on someone? Yeah. Like regular yeah, that's a nice thing with like the new like wavefront guided, wavefront optimized, Contura, the topo guided. It's like you can correct a regular astigmatism. But you would do like one of those fancier methods. Yeah, like traditional LASIK, which they were doing like 10 years ago, not as much. So, um, but no one does that really anymore. Everything's like wavefront or Contura, the topo guided. Um, and then, you know, you have to consider like steroids because after. PRK especially, people are going to be on steroids for like three months, and is that going to make glaucoma worse? Um, you know, you just got to be really careful, document everything, make sure their fields are full. Retinal disease, obviously, so so a lot of patients have high myopia, who get refractive surgery, and they're just at an increased risk for an RD. LASIK and PRK don't increase their risk, probably, but they, just people are already at high risk, so you just have to be careful and tell them, you know, you need to look out for flashes and floaters. Um, although, this is kind of a thing like, I'm sure you've seen an RD after clear lens extraction from either here or from somewhere in the community. We do them, but we usually try to uh, wait until people are um, older. But you know, there is a high rate. It's just like for the cataract surgery, like high myopes who have cataract surgery are high risk for an RD. So you have to explain that to people. A lot of times people get clear lens extraction are in their mid 40s, 50s, and they're super myopic or, and like minus 17, minus 18, they're just not a candidate for anything else. Like they have a little bit of cataracts, so you can't do a ICL. Um, and so you just have to explain that because obviously they're paying a lot of money for cataract surgery that, you know, for kind of a, a lifestyle cosmetic result, you don't want them to be really mad at you. And then there's always like, do buckles affect how well that the, uh, the, Femto second laser can maintain suction on the cornea. Um, you can do it on, like, this is like where doing like good refractions is important because sometimes patients don't correct to 2020 or 2015 and like they're 2025, 2030. You can still do LASIK or PRK, but you just have to temper their expectations. Say, so, you know, the best vision you ever had before surgery was like this, and it's probably not going to be, it's probably, we wouldn't expect it to be any better afterwards. So that's kind of the point of this slide. And apparently there are people had some kind of deviation wasn't recognized and they got unilateral refractive surgery and then they got a deviation which would totally suck. Um, um, diabetes, you can do refractive surgery on people with diabetes. As we all know, I think this is OCAP worthy. High glucose means myopia. You probably see it at the VA a lot. Um, and so you just have to be careful and poor wound healing for these people. So. You know, are they a good candidate for PRK? If if they have crappy epithelium, probably not because it's going to take a while to grow back. So, um, you can do refractive surgery on HIV. Like they have these kind of like old school extreme measures where like you wear you know one of these like bioterrorism masks when you do the procedure because you're blading the cornea and cornea dust can get in your eyes or your mucous membranes. But it's never really been proven that that can cause anything. So. We would do it, but you know, you'd want someone who wasn't like in full-blown AIDS crisis. And then autoimmune disease, you, just gotta, you can do it, but you gotta be really careful. Obviously, like an eye that looks like that, you're not gonna do anything on, but you wanna make sure that people are well-controlled. And then keloid, so like, um, you can get bad scarring with keloid scars, and we always ask about it, but like, as long as you're, as long as you're really careful, and like we use mitomycin C to decrease fibroblast growth, with PRK in these patients, they're probably gonna be fine. You just have to explain to them the risks. Um, and then this one, I was, we always get questions about. We ask, I, I usually ask about it, but this kind of like a general contraindication. It's it's not because like 
refraction changes permanently during pregnancy and nursing, but it's really like it has to be more corneal hydration status and you just don't get stable topography and so you just want to be careful and um, but they just need to wait three months after delivery and cessation of nursing and then they can be a candidate. Some people do have a change in their refraction and it can be pretty big and it can be permanent. It mainly has to do with what their corneal shape is. Um, I have some cases, but let me see what the point of this one was. Uh, yeah, I mean, eye level calculations you've probably learned are harder after cataract surgery and not as accurate. And so, like, when you're doing cataract surgery, make sure you temper expectations because it's not going to be perfect, especially if they got hyperopic LASIK because it's just not that accurate. And um, But there's some really good calculators out there. Um, you just don't want to have a hyperopic surprise because these are people who had, like, super good vision forever, and then all of a sudden cataract surgery, which all the friends had, and they're not seeing as well. And so, you know, there's the Asperger's calculator. There's other, there's a lot of different methods to do um, post-LASIK and PRK uh, surgery calcs. I think, like, the one that's kind of, they like here is Asker's website. Where I did my residency, I would just, like, use a Pentacam, and I would take, you know, there's, like, that central three-millimeter ring, and you can actually, like, use your pointer and click on each spot and tell what the Ks are. So I would take like eight points from the central three millimeter cornea and then one right in the center. And I'd average those nine spots and I'd divide by nine and I'd get like this average K and then I would put that in the Ks. It worked out really well. So there's lots of different ways. You just have to explain to people that this is not LASIK. It's not as accurate. And so it's all about expectations. When you, when you sign up people for LASIK, do you ever like let them know that that will make it harder yeah, if they if it comes up, but like a lot of these people, you know, it's not like my standard talk. I mean, especially right. when they're like thirty. Yeah. But okay. if later, I can, but the thing is, like, we're actually really good too. I mean, it's not as big as deal because as we get more data on what formulas work, like they keep updating the Asker's calculator, and it's really accurate. And so I think just like with any cataract surgery, the more data you have, the more calculations and different methods, like the more accurate your outcome's going to be. So that's what we look at. And sometimes you have a surprise and it sucks and you can do things about it. Um, so here's a patient. So this is someone I'm doing surgery on on Friday. So she's 28, non-contact lens wear, 2015 corrected both eyes. This is her like most recent refraction. So she's a high myope. And um, this is these are her corneas. So does anything stand out to anyone? Is there stigmatism with the rule, against the rule? With the rule, she might have um, inferior steepening. Yeah, she totally does. So she has like this asymmetric bow tie. I mean, right eye is not quite, but you know, little teeny bow tie on the superiorly and big, huge one inferiorly. Um, so let's look at her tomography, which is pedicam. So you can see the nice bow tie here again. Corneal thickness, pedicam is really good for doing corneal thickness. So you can see she's like 520 which in our, the refractive surgery world is fairly normal. Um, but then, look, this is that elevation map that I talked about, like the posterior elevation. You can see, like, there's not a lot of variation between kind of the central cornea and then the periphery. So there's none of those bumps where it's like plus 30, minus 30. Um, and then same with her left eye, which is the one that had the, the even kind of larger asymmetric bow tie. 518, central corneal thickness, but the posterior map looks really good. So, so like, do you think, well, I already gave the answer because I'm doing refractive surgery on her on Friday, <laughs> but, you know, what do you think we should do? Should we do LASIK, PRK? We should do PRK. Why? Because it has a lower risk of um, surgery dictation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, essentially, so when you, when we make a flap for LASIK, it's 100 microns thick, so that's 20% of the cornea. The anterior corneal stroma is stronger biomechanically than the posterior cornea. So when you cut that off, you're making the cornea weaker naturally. She might be at a higher risk for ectasia. We don't know, but based upon kind of like the keratoconus criteria, she doesn't really meet it. But but you just have to be really careful. She's a she's a higher myope. Um, do you have a question? So would she be considered a form frost? No, no. So like if she was, yeah, form. Uh, what I would want this to have like some kind of elevation like that you know like plus 20 plus 30 
then I would call her like form fruits keratoconus or keratoconus suspect, and then I wouldn't do refractive surgery on her. I'd say we could do crosslinking on you because you have keratoconus, and then probably consider it. But for her, no. But the big thing is, is you know, the risk for ectasia in refractive surgery is one out of two thousand now, which is interestingly is the risk for keratoconus in the general population. So I know at, at Moran, with the criteria for like kind of ruling out keratoconus people as candidates, they've had one case of post-LASIK ectasia in like the last 20 years. That So, you know, you can be super careful. Sometimes it's gonna happen, but it's really rare. Um, so I told this patient, I explained the risk for ectasia. I said, I wouldn't do LASIK on you. We would do PRK and just explain the recovery's a little bit longer, but it'd be worth it, safe, and you're probably gonna do really well. But you just have to know that there's this one in 2000 risk that you could get thinning over time and need a cornea transplant. And when you tell them like it's one out of 2,000, like people are usually okay with it. it seems acceptable enough. Um, LASIK complications, I mentioned dry eye, ectasia, I showed that. Flap issues, I talked about this in the grand rounds, but you know, you're creating a new space, so you can get infections, you can get melts, um, usually from infection or from epithelial and growth where epithelial cells kind of go in the flap. Most of the time it's not visually significant. With femtolaser, the the risk for um, epithelial growth is lower. Um, but if it gets in the central cornea, you have to lift the flap, you have to scrape it off, you have to use like myomycin C to stop fibroblastic growth. And then dehiscence, so I, like, I never forgot this. So when I was a med student, I rotated here with Dr. Mifflin, and he told me like we were like doing laser, LASIK one day, and he's like, it's like 10 years ago, I had a resident call me crying because a patient who just had LASIK like the day before got a car accident, and came in with like bilateral giant abrasions and basically the LASIK flaps had dehissed and the, the resident peeled them off, peeled off the flaps. And obviously like, I think the patient ended up doing okay, but like you screw up their cornea when you do that. So I never forgot that. And so when I was a second year resident, um, I had, there was a cop and he got hit by a bungee cord in the eye. And like he had a LASIK flap because this LASIK was 12 years before. And so I like irrigated it really well and I put it back down and I think they had to be like they had to decapitate it eventually because like it got a bunch of epithelial growth but I never forgot that so you can get that years and years down the road so just if you see like these you know flat things superiorly <laughs> it's probably at least ask about their surgery history and um, anyways does it, so does everyone does everyone still do the um where that's connected superiorly. Isn't there like, was there some people that are moving towards doing it like temporally or? There are some people who do that, but it's more common to put the hinge superiorly. So um, I think there was someone here who did them temporarily, but the vast majority of people do superiorly. So um, yeah. I'm not sure if that was changing. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's fine both ways, um, but the newest like, the new like sexy thing is like the make the flap thinner. Um, but we did a study, so the nice thing about our, we have like the newest uh, Alcon laser, and it actually does like intraoperative opti optical pachymetry. And so you, you program like the thickness of the flap with the femtosecond laser, but we were finding that the flap is actually ending up being thinner than we would program, like almost without fail, like 20 microns. So we do, we set our flaps at 120 microns, and they usually end up between 120 and 100. And the reason why, if you have a thin flap, then you can, it's just less stable and it can DS easier. Um, PRK, so the reason PRK, PRK was like approved by the FDA like two years before LASIK, but it became like really unpopular pretty much right after LASIK came out, and it's because of haze. So obviously you can have a little complications with like having a huge epithelial defect, but we put everyone banished contact lenses and their own antibiotics, and I don't think we've ever had an infectious post-PRK case here ever. Um, we've seen them because they get, come from the outside, but haze was like the big thing because basically what happens is you ablate Bowman's layer when you do refractive surgery. It probably doesn't matter because they found that the epithelium probably increases the number of hemidesmosomes after refractive surgery, but when you get this kind of remodeling of the anterior stromus epithelial border, you can have like collagen fibrils that are, you know, instead of being like geometric and straight, they kind of go all over, and so you get this haze. Most of the time it's not visually significant, but if it is, it can be like 
really annoying for people. They can have pretty crappy vision and almost without fail, it always goes away on its own, but it can take like years. So we had a patient come in from an outside provider just like last month and he was like 2050 in one eye. And this was someone who like didn't keep his follow-ups. He didn't keep on his steroids for three months like he's supposed to. And he was like really mad and he wanted to be retreated. But Dr. Mifflin was like, you know, this is going to go away. It's just going to take a while. You just got to, it's going to take time. If people are on steroid and they come in with haze and they're doing everything they're supposed to, we'll go to a stronger steroid. Usually we use like after the first two weeks, we use like FML for three months. So we'll switch back to PRED. We'll do restasis because you know it has some kind of anti-inflammatory effect. We'll do vitamin C. There's some idea that UV light can damage the that kind of interface. That's and so it can increase haze formation. So vitamin C might help. Doxycycline obviously is an anti-collagenase, so that might help too. Um, but most people, even if they have a little bit of haze, see really well. So and you, you haze formation is increased if people are have like pigmented skin or they're higher higher myope. So we use mitomycin C on those patients, usually from like 12 to 20 seconds, depending on, uh, there's no set thing, it's just kind of what Dr. Mifflin like, yeah, they're like a minus eight, let's use 15 seconds. So anyways, but it works well. Um, you just gotta make sure you wash off the mitomycin C. Um, oh yeah, so okay, I didn't do a silence, but so there's wavefront optimized and there's wavefront guided. So. The, the two biggest, most popular lasers are the Allegretto, which is, it's like the wave light, Allegretto wave light, and that's from Alcon, that's what we have. And that laser in the United States is wavefront optimized. And then the other most common one is the Vizex, which we used to have here. Um, a couple years ago they had both, and that's a wavefront guided. So the whole idea is like when you do an ablation, like, you know, with, you're trying to make a mountain into a mesa. You're trying to flatten the cornea, so there's this transition zone where you're not ablating the peripheral cornea and people get higher order aberrations kind of at that interface where the ablation was. And so older LASIK didn't really, there was like a small transition zone between kind of normal cornea and lasered cornea. And so the, the idea behind wavefront optimize is you take someone's refraction and you treat that on their cornea and then, but it kind of like smooths out that transition zone so you get less higher order aberrations. So like when people have large pupils or their pupils are dilated, like they get less kind of peripheral light rays screwing up their vision. Wavefront guided is, is more where you, you treat the refraction but also there's like this complex algorithm where they, they kind of treat the topography also. And so it's not true like topography guided, which is a new thing, um, but they, they kind of take maps and stuff. Have you guys seen the wave scan? It's like this, it's on the fourth floor. It's a machine and it basically like, you take some pictures of the eye and it tells you like what ratio of higher order aberrations they have, like spherical aberration and comma and trifoil, coma, um, and all these other, quadrifoil and all these other ones that I don't remember their names. Um, but basically you take those maps and you input it into the, the VizX computer and then you take the refraction and it, it does like this algorithm and it does an ablation to get rid of higher order aberrations. They both work super well. We did like a head to head fellow eye trial here like four years ago and found that both um, cause less higher order aberrations than traditional LASIK and they're both, people will see just as well with, with both of them. So um, they're both popular. The Visex is really popular because they, it's a roll-on, roll-off laser. So, like, you know, if you if you don't do that much refractive surgery, but you want to do some and you can't afford a half a million dollar laser, you can like have a company come in and they'll like bring a truck and they'll bring the laser in for like a day so you can treat all your patients. And the Visex laser does that. So the the Allegretto doesn't. So so that in the community that's probably more popular. But like places that do a lot of refractive surgery, um, they are trending towards getting the wave light Alcon refractive suit like we have because it's probably, it's newer, it's faster at making the, the flaps and it's, it's faster ablation and it can do this topography guided, which is basically topography guided, it, it, you basically just, you treat the topography. So you have to take all these like measurements of the cornea and then when you kind of input your refraction and stuff into their system, it, 
it tries, it does more of a um, treatment of the corneal shape than actually the wafering guide it does. And so you get, the whole idea is to decrease spherical aberration, which can give you like night myopia and things like that. So we just started doing it, like, like I said, I think like a month and a half ago. Um, so I don't know if it's gonna be any better because our, our wavefront optimized outcomes are so good now. And Dr. Mifflin tends to, he tends to like look at the topography and he'll take someone's refraction and if they have cylinder, he'll tend to push the, instead of treating whatever axis they like in their glasses, he'll tend to try to treat the axis that's in the topography anyways. So I don't know if it's gonna be better than what we do now, but we're the fellow study this, the second half of the year and then next year and probably the year after we're looking at like wavefront guided, I mean topography guided in one eye and wavefront optimized in the other eye of patients to see if it's, there's any difference. So. Any questions? Um, Comments? Uh, how about like some people like their LASIK will only last like you know, X number of years. Um, do you talk to patients about that beforehand and what yeah. is the information? Because like our book didn't say much about Good that. question. So the rates are, are so, so kind of, they, they call it, it sounds really fancy. Remember Dr. Smith talked about Dr. K-Spear? That was like his, the guy. He invented this term called, it, you're, you needed an enhancement. So it's not a touch up. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's an enhancement. So it sounds really fancy. But basically, yeah, in, at our patients, 5% of patients get a little nearsighted over time. And it typically happens in between like eight to 10 years. And so, so if they need to be retreated and they have like enough residual stromal bed left, then it's totally reasonable to retreat them. And so um, we here, we like part of, I talk to everyone about that. I say, you know, there's like this 5% chance. Some people are at higher risk for that. So like young people, like if they're 21, female, high, high myopic corrections are at a higher, higher chance for needing an enhancement down the road. So. Um, we, I tell everyone about it and I say, you know, if you need it, it's like $400 and basically it's just the cost of the click fee for using the laser here. Some places have like a lifetime guarantee, which is kind of like, it's really ingenious and tricky because like basically they say, we'll treat you for free down the road if you ever need it, but you have to come into our office every year for a full eye exam. And so by the time they need one, they're going to spend more money on copays and whatever. So we just like 400 bucks, you know, if you ever need it. And, and, and I think that you know, our rates are fairly low. I've seen Dr. Miffin retreat a couple people, but a lot of times like they're like minus one, minus 150, and usually they're like already in their mid 40s and like they kind of have this nice like monovision and so most people are like, yeah, it's, it's fine. So it's so four, $400 is a quick fee? Yeah, yeah, for it's like regular. So there's all these things. So like with the new topography guided, like there's an extra $65 click fee on top of what your, what, what the LASIK click fee is. So, yeah, it's ingenious. The company charges you half a million dollars for the laser, and yeah, you, so every every use, it's cost more money. So, um, but yeah, it's good. If you guys, I think Dr. Biffin will let you guys do refractive surgery if you can find someone and you get the fellow discount, which is like actually like the least expensive way in the Wasatch Front to get like high quality refractive surgery. One thing I learned, and you know, have you ever seen like advertisements and they're like, yeah, come in, 250 bucks for LASIK. What they do with that is it's like a la carte. So like if you're like a minus one, minus two, it'll be $250 with like a, th like a two previous generations ago laser. But then if you want to get like the wavefront guided or optimized and you're like a minus five, you're gonna end up paying the same price as if you go anywhere, maybe a little bit more. So it's kind of- So what's, what is it for you? Like if to do it again? Um, it's, I think I it's, it's cheaper for residents. Is it cheaper for residents? I think it's the same. Oh, if you, you mean cheaper for residents if you get it done? No, oh. no. cheaper. It used to be like a graded scale, but I think it's all. I think they just switched it all. So they just raised the price. So it's $1,400 per eye. And then I think there might be a little bit of a discount if you're like a U employee, right. maybe. Um, so yeah, but that's like pretty, I mean, they charge, I think it's like about 2,000 an eye for like if the attendees do okay. it. The cheapest other, like to get what we offer anywhere else, like the cheapest price I've found is um, 1,800 bucks per eye. So it's, it's like a really good deal. And I'm amazed that people want to get it. Fellow? No, people in general, like they want to pay $4,000. 
It's like glasses. Yeah, I don't know. You just love your glasses. So. Yeah, your glasses. <laughs> you know, so so if you think about it, actually the the lifetime risk of having a ocular complication wearing contacts is higher than getting refractive surgery. If you're a good candidate. So for some people that's enough, you know. And I mean, I don't wear glasses. I was blessed with like perfect eyeballs. It seems super annoying. My wife wears contacts and like it just sucks. Like you know, if you forget them or it falls on the ground, like that's annoying. Yeah. I don't know. Anyways, it's I think, safe. I've been camping before where they froze. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> So refractive surgery is good. You just have to have the good, a right candidate, and you know, doing the procedure is not hard. Once you learn cataract surgery, that's way harder to do. But it's like the brain sweat that goes into deciding as a candidate is the hard part. So, um, but yeah, if you guys ever have anyone who's interested, just have them. You know, they can come in to see you for like a screening, and you can call us, and we can tell you what you need to do and stuff. And um, I think it, you know, kind of sells itself if someone's interested. So, and that's it. There's some other stuff. Um, wait, really. Sorry, well, I just have one more question. Oh, yeah. I don't know if Dr. Mithlin went over this last time, so maybe you guys who were there could say, um, like, you know, one thing I think that might come up on OCAPS is like steeper corneas and like the flap complications. Obviously, it's not relevant oh, yeah. now since they're all photos that can flaps, but why do steeper corneas um, more, like, are more likely to buttonhole and why flatter corneas are more likely to have like a transection with a flap is totally loose? should have read about that. <laughs> I always forget that one. Yeah. Um, I think it has to do with, um, actually, I, I'm not even going to say because I don't want to sound like, I don't want to give you a black pearl. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong wisdom. Did, but did Dr. Bethlehem mention that last time? They didn't time? talk about yeah. it. it. It does have to do with like the, how the, 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 the like suction the occurs and like what it does because I know, like with um, like when you you actually use the same pretty much same keratome when you cut up um, the a D sac and you know cutting off and you can get different size buttons depending on how much suction is applied. Um, so yeah, I wish I, I should have read about that one. So you yeah. Flat complication. So like flatter corneas are more likely to um, have the the flap get cut off totally, so it doesn't have a hinge. And then, like, steeper corneas are more likely to buttonhole, I guess. There's, like, a hole inside the flap. That yeah. makes sense, though, right? Because it's just because it's so steep. It just yeah. Button. Like, you just cut right through the whole cornea. No, that's, no, that's, 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 yeah, oh, it doesn't that's make the sense. That's the complication so I just that had to associates, is associated with the flap. That's how it's for me. Yeah, I just had to memorize it. Yeah. Is like, I think there's a hole inside the flap. Yeah. Oh, that's that's right. what it's so We've actually seen that. that makes sense. Right, yes, <laughs> correct. We've seen on patients who've had their flap set too thin. And they come in and they've they've had a buttonhole. It's less common with the femto than when you're doing like manually with the blade, but it still can happen and it's kind of annoying. So this patient we ended up doing PRK on. So let let the patient heal for like a year and then did PRK on them. So anyways, I hope that was helpful. I mean, you know, there's not a lot I don't think it's I don't think surgery is very high yield for OCAPs to be honest. Like last year, I don't. Re I remember like maybe like one or two questions, but definitely off the questions has way too many refractive surgery questions that are like, you know, really minutia type garbage that you just don't need. I think that there were. Thank you. Are there some calculating the residual stromal bed? Questions? Yeah, a uh, Mutterlin's formula. Yeah. yeah. I basically remember essentially like. For every, for every diopter of myopia, you're, you're blading 14 to 15 microns. And in general, I mean, when you add astigmatism, it gets more complex, but that's basically kind of how I, like, so that's how I figure out what my refraction was. Yeah.